Right. We we are waiting for a few others, but I think for everybody's time, we'll we'll make a start. Uh, the session is being recorded, so uh, you know they, it will be distributed to those who are, are late or were unable to make the session today. So, um, so welcome to this uh, final uh, uh, a dissemination workshop um, and webinar from the Circular Cricket Gear project. And today, myself, Lillian, and and Darsha will be presenting, you know, our findings and thoughts from the research and development over the over the over the last year. I'd like to firstly also say thank you to the NICER program and UKRI for the funding to enable us to progress this project. So. Um, I'm from the, uh, my name is Martin Charter, from the Centre for Sustainable Design at University of Creative Arts. And uh, as, as mentioned uh, uh, just a minute ago, this particular project, the Circular Cricket Year project, had funding from UKRI, Circular Economy Hub Flexible Fund, and ran between September last year and August this year. And a range of objectives, um, uh, um, you know, and primarily to deliver a, a working prototype around some form of uh, circular cricket gear, which fortunately we were able to achieve. And you'll hear more about that later on. So within the team, we had an excellent interdisciplinary team of, uh, of, of people um, with business skills, material skills, design skills, uh, uh you know long-standing consultancy skills and even a, an ex-professional cricketer who also is a sustainability consultant as well so that was very useful uh, that we had a range of different perspectives in the project we had a range of different people in the consortium uh and you know i won't repeat them all we can see them see them here uh, but again, this was standards, association, uh, materials, uh, producer, and testing. Um, one of the challenges associated with cricket gear is uh, if we look at sustainability in, in, in a broader context, there's virtually no research has been undertaken on exploring the sustainability of cricket gear. And so that's almost our starting point. Um, but then also what we have seen over the years for a variety of reasons, the manufacturing of uh, cricket gear, whether it's bats or soft, so-called softs, cricket balls, has really moved offshore with a significant proportion uh, manufactured in northern Pakistan and northern India. So effectively, we've got, you know, this perverse set of issues where the willow is still produced in the UK, uh, but is then sent to, uh, you know, Asia to be formed into the bats with handles, uh, immer you know, coming in, with the rubber for handles coming from other parts of Asia, and then it's reshipped back to the UK. So you've got a double set of embedded carbon moving backwards and forwards, even with the, uh, with the bats themselves. And really, we've moved to this sort of stage where, to our knowledge, there is no uh, manufacturing of the soft um, soft uh, gear, that's pads, gloves in the UK, and very limited production of bats um, and, uh, you know, um, ball, ball, cricket ball making is, is deemed to be extinct in the UK. What we undertook in, in a feeder project to this particular project is we tried to understand the level of waste uh, in the sector uh, or um, underutilized uh, materials, products and components. And we came up with some quite significant uh, annualized waste figures here. This is ongoing um, and based on a series of assumptions. Uh, and we're always happy to hear people uh, that are able to provide more information uh, to help us optimize our figures here. But we found it also, let alone very difficult to generate the waste figures and having to sort of generate, um, use a lot of assumptions. It was very difficult to find actually uh, data on the first life sales of gear as well. So there's a, there's a lot of gaps, but 
there is significant waste and there is limited reuse and virtually no repair and refurbishment. So uh, what we uh, what we've developed is a series of projects uh, that uh, the circular cricket gear is sort of sitting at the centre uh, where we've looked at sort of feedback backwards and forwards between these different projects. So we had one one project uh, that uh, focused on uh, exploring uh, the, the potential use of vegan cricket gear or uh, vegan leather in cricket gear. Uh, we've had another project where we've analyze the infrastructure and issues around repair, reuse, and refurbishment of cricket gear. We've also uh, uh, gone further into detail in producing a, a checklist into how to set up a cricket gear reuse scheme that will touch on many of the issues we're discussing today. And also we're working on a, uh, a carbon calculator for the reuse of cricket gear as well and I'll, I'll come back to that um, later on. So what we're covering today um, or what we did in the project and we'll go into more detail is uh, various uh, you know uh, deliverables from the project that culminated in uh, a prototype and also some recommendations for uh, policy makers and stakeholders. Uh, we completed an innovation workshop um, to really start to flesh out so-called product circularity uh, issues related to, to cricket gear. We then uh, undertook an exercise to disassemble a cricket pair of cricket pads. We believe we've undertaken the first life cycle analysis of a pair of cricket uh, batting pads. And again, we've this is part of the problem. We've found very little data, very few studies analyzing the environmental impact of cricket on a on a sort of uh, sporting level if you like but but also at a product level um we also did research into sustainable materials uh, the potential use of sustainable materials uh, and the use of existing materials for cricket gear in addition we completed a survey of 42 uh, recreational cricket players which we'll hear more about um, and then we were able to produce a prototype batting pad that incorporated four circular design innovations and finally we completed uh, uh, a set of policy recommendations uh, that uh, uh, are, are now available and we will be distributing these further so without further ado I will pass across to my colleague Lillian um, to to go into the details uh, and then Lillian in good rugby ball uh, manner will then pass across to Darshall and I'll end up hopefully catching and not fumbling the ball at the end. Excellent, thank you Martin. Yes, yeah, so um, I will start by presenting uh, the findings from the innovation workshop. Uh, next slide please. Yeah, so the workshop was held in uh, December 22 December 2022, and the main objectives were to generate concepts related to product circularity for cricket gear, uh, to identify the most feasible strategies for implementation within batting pads, but also to introduce um, product circularity concepts to uh, the CCG partners. Uh, further, um, next slide, please. So, um, there were three separate sections to the innovation workshop. We started out by um, a five minute presentation with the findings uh, related to a visit to Lord Taverners uh, conducted by a PhD student. Then we moved on to an online innovation session where participants were required to generate uh, product circularity um, related uh, strategies for cricket gloves, uh, pads and balls. And this was followed by a 15 minute session uh, to explore the the four most feasible um, product circularity strategies um, on a pair of uh, cricket batting pads. Now, participants were participants' ideas were recorded on a Miro board, and these were subsequently uh, discussed individually. So, in terms of the findings um, and the discussions based on the Lord Taverner's visit, 
the main issues that were raised by participants um, were related to the quality of the cricket gear donated and the health and safety issues regarding uh, the reuse of PPE. There were also um, considerations around uh, the ethics and balancing motivation. So, for example, if um, people can play, um, even if the uh, products are slightly damaged, um, then this surely must be a plus. Um, there were also um, issues that were raised around the challenges experienced by Lord Taverners. Uh, for example, uh, the very limited infrastructure that exists in the UK for the collection, storage, um, sorting and distribution of Second Life uh, cricket gear as well as some of the potential barriers uh, to local reuse. Um, so, so for, for example, um, due to uh, sponsorship or logos, sometimes they have to be shipped um, overseas. Uh, there were also discussions around the use of um, uh, using spare parts within uh, PPE, uh, as this would require new testing. Um, so there is a need to ensure that retesting is uh, cost effective and is an area that should be considered in the revision of um, the British standards uh, for cricket gear. Uh, there are also legal challenges um, that were discussed in terms of placing an item uh, on the market with uh, reused or used uh, parts and components and certain products um, that cannot be reused uh, for legal reasons, for legal or health and safety reasons, such as helmets. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as for the findings in terms of um, think session. Uh, findings from this innovation uh, session indicated that uh, reduce and reuse are perceived as the most feasible strategies for developing uh, circular cricket gear and um, further discussion into how to implement uh, these strategies was outside the scope of the workshop objectives um, therefore uh, we're not presenting any ideas within uh, this uh, within the workshop. Um, however, significant concepts were developed, um, uh, significant concepts were not developed for repurposing and upcycling. Um, and then there were further um, general issues that were identified, including, um, for example, there needs to be um, a change of perception with regards to the materials that can be used within cricket or the quantity of kit um, that is perceived as necessary. So some of the propositions were to include um, media articles or newspapers to raise awareness um, in this regard. Uh, it was also identified that further investment is required um, to foster sustainability within cricket. And there is also a need to create a um, supply chain for second life gear. Then um, there are also questions around, could things um, be diff be done differently uh, for women's uh, cricket gear, as this is also an emerging um, topic within um, our discussions. Uh, next slide, please. Not. Um, and then the third section of the innovation uh, workshop, uh, participants were provided with a um, predefined uh, product circularity checklist that included uh, design focus areas and options for improvements um, for design. And uh, participants were asked to, um, to evaluate uh, which of the strategies um, they thought to be more feasible for um, batting pads at rating from four to one, where four uh, was perceived as um, being the most relevant and one as uh, one of, of the least uh, relevant. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, so based on um, this exercise, um, the four most feasible strategies that were selected uh, for batting pads um, were to reduce the process waste, maximize the ease of maintenance, increase access to spare parts, and increase the use of uh, renewable uh, materials. An example of ideas that began to emerge in relation to the strategies mentioned above, for example, um, develop new solutions for uh, washing in terms of um, <clears throat> ease of maintenance. Now through, um, and this could be enabled through design, for example, um, by facilitating the removal of the inner, um, of the inner padding. Uh, where often um, sweat stains uh, tend to deteriorate uh, the, the material, or, for example, um, being able to wash uh, the exterior case. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so 
the, the next task um, within uh, the project uh, was to conduct a disassembly exercise. And the, the aim, um, the focus of this exercise was first of all, to identify the internal uh, components and materials. Um, now this was required uh, due to the lack of um, access to industry data. So we, we had to um, physically disassemble a, a batting pad to, um, to see uh, what the various parts and components um, were. And um, based on on, um, on this disassembly exercise, uh, we also um, conducted the, the streamlined LCA. So next slide, please. Um, so here you can see um, some of the various uh, components um, that were found. Now, surprisingly, and I think we had uh, various discussions around this, um, there was a thermoformed um, polystyrene kneecap within the um, batting pad. Now, I think that these um, were implemented back in the 1990s, 2000s. Uh, we, we're still um, trying, we're still identifying uh, the exact um, drivers for um, some of these product innovations. Um, but yeah. You can see uh, there are various components, um, the, the internal um, padding, uh, the, the cane, uh, the mesh, uh, high density foam, uh, wadding, and um, there's also paperboard and um, yeah, the, the main uh, exterior case made from um, PU leather. Next slide, please. So based on uh, this exercise, we then produced an inventory um, to uh, quantify the mass of each component, uh, also um, make note of their technical requirements and the functional requirements. Uh, it's it's um, important to mention that um, assumptions were made in terms of the material as um, we um, weren't able to access uh, industry data. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of the findings and recommendations based on this um, exercise, uh, it was identified that the size and the shape of the components and the materials appear to be cut based on experience. So no layout plans have been used for cutting. Um, there are different components. Um, uh, the different components present an excess of material uh, that is not required for the product's uh, performance and in turn this results in um, increased waste of materials and resources. There's also a lack of standardization of the internal components that could potentially hinder their recovery and reuse. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so now I will move on to um, the streamlined LCA for the batting pads. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, in terms of background for um, this, for the LCA, uh, as Martin mentioned previously, uh, we conducted um, some desk research in terms of LCAs uh, available for cricket gear in general and um, no prior LCA studies for cricket gear were identified at this point. Um, so we focused on uh, batting pads um, uh, for this streamlined LCA, and it was conducted using a software called Sustainable Minds. Um, it was selected over other um, LCA software for its focus on early product design and development, being user-friendly and also quite um, time, time efficient. Um, the LCA addressed uh, the entire life cycle of the product, so from production, uh, including raw material, extraction, um, processing, manufacturing, and assembly. Uh, also, in terms of use, uh, transportation from um, the end user has been included as part of um, as part of the use phase. And in terms of the end of life, um, calculations have assumed that all materials, parts, and components of the product are landfilled, and therefore. Uh, no transport to waste treatment um, plants or um, waste treatment has been calculated. Uh, next slide, please. So the goals of this um, LCA were to generate insight into um, the environmental impact of cricket batting pads, um, but also to identify opportunities for improvement through circular uh, design principles. Uh, the functional unit um, 
was established at three seasons. So this included 60 games plus three um, indoor, net, indoor nets. And the assumption was um, based on uh, younger players. Uh, in terms of um, the life of batting pads, uh, we will um, show further uh, within this presentation uh, results from a, a survey conducted with 42 um, cricket players that indicates that perhaps um, the gear is kept for longer. But for the purpose of um, the LCA, uh, the functional unit um, is of three uh, seasons. In terms of the system boundaries, um, this included production, distribution, use and disposal. Uh, for geography, uh, the assessment was based on the sole use of the cricket batting pads being used uh, within the UK. And then um, several assumptions had to be made due to the lack of um, primary data. And this includes um, the origin of materials, suppliers used for manufacturing, um, which had an impact in calculations related to uh, transport. Um, for example, the distances and mode of transports, which are also based on um, assumptions. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, next slide, please. So, thank you. Uh, so, in terms of the uh, results from the L um, from the LCA, uh, indicate that the highest environmental impact associated with the production of a pair of batting pads uh, is um, related to human toxicity, and this is associated with the production of uh, the high density foam used for the internal uh, padding. This was followed by uh, the global warming potential associated with um, the CO2 emissions uh, embedded in the entire life cycle of the product and uh, fossil fuel uh, depletion. Next slide, please. <clears throat> From a material perspective, um, the three main contributors uh, to the product's um, overall uh, score is the, is the use of high density foam. Uh, and the polyester used for the product's lining and the polyester uh, used for the mesh. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of the impact um, by life cycle stage, uh, the main contributor to the product's uh, carbon footprint is the manufacturing stage. And um, within this phase, uh, the main contributor is the production of polyester um, that is used for the lining and the mesh. And this is followed by the production of high density foam uh, for the protective padding. Now, the third contributor um, would be the transportation. Um, so the product, the carbon footprint related to the transportation. However, as mentioned previously, uh, transportation calculations for this report um, only considered the transportation from primary materials to the manufacturing sites in northern India and the shipment to warehouses uh, within the UK. Um, Therefore, uh, from the UK to the retailers and consumers, transport from the UK to retailers and consumers uh, has been excluded. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of um, conclusions from the LC LCA, um, these offer an, ov an initial overview of the main areas of environmental concern related to the product's um, life cycle. Uh, the highest impact is related to the manufacturing stage. And um, the LCA also indicates that uh, the use of polyester for the lining and the mesh are the highest contributors to the product's overall carbon footprint. Uh, the study indicates that the use of um, high density foam represents the highest environmental impact in relation to human health damage. And the primary gap in the, in the report is that um, the data related to the CO2 emissions associated with distribution of raw materials to suppliers, manufacturers, warehouses, and the final distribution of the um, products to retailers and customers. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, so based on these um, findings, uh, we have three uh, four uh, main recommendations. Um, so first of all, to focus on strategies to extend the life of the product so that the average um, use of the product can be extended be beyond three years, um, or um, parts and, and components uh, can be replaced. Also to focus on strategies to replace the reuse and or extend the life of um, high density foam in particular that is used for the internal uh, protective batting pad. Um, and then aligned to this, um, also 
uh, explore uh, the extension of um, the textile, the polyester uh, textile used for uh, the lining and the mesh. And then lastly, um, for this to be commercially viable, uh, there is a need to explore the potential cost implications of implementing um, recommendations one, two, and three. Next slide, please. Uh, so now we will um, move on to uh, the materials in cricket gear and their sustainable alternatives. Um, and I will pass the slides on to Darshan. Thank you, Lillian. Uh, so I'll uh, talk quite briefly about uh, the range of sustainable material alternatives we looked at, um, focusing on a range of different cricket gear products, including cricket balls, pads, and gloves. Um, to start off with, Martin, if you move to the next slide, um, we explored some of the challenges in current uh, cricket gear. Firstly, they are all multi-component materials, which presents challenges for recycling, firstly, to disassemble the product in the first place. Um, they're also all materials that are derived from complex supply chains um, that is spread globally. Um, and these are all assembled um, through intricate processes, which are also significantly time consuming. Uh, and during the design of these products, there isn't any consideration for end of life, disposal, disassembly, reuse, etc. Um, and as part of a design brief to ensure circularity, these should be quite clearly stated in the brief in the first place. Uh, so that's one important step that we would suggest uh, is integrated into the whole process um, in the future. Um, so the key challenges of sustainable materials uh, are also recognized, firstly, current sustainable materials that we have identified, many of them are new. And the cricket gear sector in amongst other sectors uh, can be pretty averse uh, in terms of the risks associated with uh, those materials, um, in terms of uh, confidence by manufacturers uh, and users. The other aspect is uh, while many of these so-called sustainable materials are referred to as sustainable, um, the LCAs are not always conducted uh, and they're not always verified by third party um, uh, methodologies. So that's something that we need to be clearer about uh, as well. And when we have done many of these studies before, for example, on vegan leather, we have tried to uh, quite clearly identify which ones have verified LCAs, which ones don't. Um, so in many cases, even the composition is not very clear. Uh, the third challenge with current sustainable materials tends to be scale and sale scalability and uh, supply chain uh, issues. Um, because it's a global sport uh, and a huge number of products are produced in a range of different factories, some are hand machine, uh, hand processed, some are machine processed, the materials need to be able to uh, be processed through a variety of different skills and tools. Um, and, and therefore, scale and scalability are uh, very important as well. Uh, so going into uh, uh, some of the example alternative materials in the next slide. Um, we started off by producing these Ashby charts, which are material uh, performance charts. So for example, in this case, on the y-axis, you have the stiffness of a material, and on the x-axis, you have the carbon footprint from primary production of a material. And looking at the range of different uh, materials that are currently used in, in cricket gear, we see that, firstly, that there is a great variety, and they have a range of different properties. Um, but such charts are quite helpful to illustrate visually uh, differences uh, and enable comparison between the materials. What we have noticed is in many cases for cricket gear, the materials are either 100% renewably natural, uh, either they are synthetic plastics, so 100% fossil fuel derived. Um, so it, it's at that end, uh, those 
ends of the continuum that we find materials. There's There are only a very few exceptions. For example, in the case of rubber or cardboard, where they are not 100% bio-based or 100% fossil fuel derived. Uh, so there is a scope for much more innovation in the center. Um, we also find that materials are typically in the form of foams, particularly where cushioning or padding is required uh, in fiber or textile form. Um, or alternatively in sheet form, for example, leather casings or bulk form. So the core of a ball, which is cork or the blade of uh, a willow bat. Um, so I think now we go more into more detail for each product. Uh, in cricket ball, there are a, different, a number of different layers. There's the polish, uh, there's the seam, um, and of course there's the leather casing. And then following that, as you go into the center of the ball, you have the core, and sometimes the core is either cork or uh, granulated rubber or a composite of rubber and cork, uh, but it can also be a combination of multiple layers of cork that is wound by twine. Um, and, and you can see that, and as, as I mentioned, depending on where you're playing in the world, who the manufacturer is, uh, you find a variety of different uh, architectures of cricket balls. Um, the selection of the materials currently is based on the variety of different properties that are uh, required for the functioning of the product. Um, usually for the lacquer, it's a nitrocellulose lacquer or a polyurethane coating. Um, that nitrocellulose is 100% bio-based, whereas um, polyurethane is 100% fossil fuel derived currently. Uh, the leather is typically bovine leather, which is aluminum tanned, um, usually uh, produced in the UK or uh, in terms of volume uh, in India. Uh, you have linen typically for the uh, seam uh, stitching thread. Um, and for the twine, you often use wool. Um, historically, it's been a worsted yarn and hence wool tends to work quite well. Uh, and it's always been cork. But over the past 30 years, 40 years, rubber has been integrated more and more. And of course, once you start incorporating more rubber, the bounce uh, and the behavior of the ball starts to change as well. Uh, in the next slide, we have a few alternatives for uh, many of these uh, products. So, for example, for coatings and polishes, we have identified a number of different um, water repellent coatings, PFC-free water repellent coatings such as PTFE. Beeswax is quite a good one as well, which we have uh, found to be um, um, compatible with a number of different vegan leathers like banana ticks. Um, we have also found a funky super coating, which is based on fungus, um, although this is currently still very much an R&D phase. Um, it's been used for textiles uh, at the moment. Um, and uh, there are also elements to explore or, or learn from the automotive sector, for example, where le leather is used ex extensively in upholstery and for seats, where abrasion resistance is quite critical, color transfer is very important. Some of these characteristics are transferable to cricket balls as well. And there, um, because of stringent requirements, for end of life uh, regulations and um, uh, for corporate uh, social responsibility purposes, moving more towards sustainable materials, there is an emergence of bio-based polyurethanes, BPUs. They are quite small percentage of the market currently, but uh, a, a rapidly growing market. So Covestro, who are who are formerly a uh, buyer, a big producer. Uh, use industrial sugars and microorganisms from um, food waste or, or agricultural waste to produce bio-based polyurethanes. Sometimes they also use uh, waste vegetables or residual oils and flats that are fats that are not for human consumption to produce these as well. Um, and the current, uh, some of the current coatings they have produced can be up to 70% in bio content. Uh, there isn't one coating yet that is 100% bio co content uh, as a bio-based PU. Um, in the next slide, we have some other examples for um, uh, for the leathers, uh, and we had we have had 
a couple of focusing on these, so I won't dwell in, on these in much detail, but uh, we've explored a range of different leathers deriving from leaves, from fruits, from tree stems, from fungus and from fish as well. Um, the, the bottom line is currently no bio-based leather we have seen is an, a complete alternative to bovine leather. Um, and there is a lot of testing that we still need to uh, complete. Part of the challenge has been acquiring uh, sufficient specifications of the leather that is used in industry so that we have a, 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 an accurate benchmark of what properties we actually need to meet, what performance levels we need to meet. But we have identified some potential of, uh, of, of uh, vegan chamois leathers, as well as for, um, for the palms of, of gloves, for example, um, as well as um, uh, some bio-based pineapple skin, uh, sorry, pineapple leaf leathers as potentials as well. But again, none of them are suitable for cricket balls. In the next slide, um, we have some example uh, testing data for these where we have looked at uh, the stretchability of vegan leathers, the uh, tear resistance and the tensile strengths. We've looked at the microstructure as well and abrasion resistance amongst a range of different properties to uh, start exploring um, the, these, these materials. Um, in the next slide, um, examples for core materials uh, replacements include recycled uh, cork uh, waste granulates, particularly from the uh, built environment sector where a large amount of cork is being used. So we need to think about cascading uses of, of a variety of different bio-based materials as uh, a number of different sectors move towards bio-based materials and the limited bio-based resources we have. We need to think about uh, the cost as well, and therefore cascading uses is, uh, is ideal to ensure that the carbon is locked into these materials for as long as possible. Coconut palm wood is another possibility, as well as hemp shives and other bulky uh, granulate type agricultural waste. For seams, in as an alternative flax, which is already quite sustainable, you could use hemp, jute, ramy, sisal, which are historically used for rope making or quite strong, strong stitching threads. Uh, for the midsole cores where worsted wool yarn is used, recycled wool could be considered, particularly the discrete length of the fibers is not an issue in this case. Um, cashmere and viscose rayon uh, could also be used as well as blending wools with polyesters or cottons. Um, moving on to the gloves and pads, uh, we have grouped these together because uh, we are able to uh, categorize a range of different materials into, for example, high impact resistant rigid molded composites, components, as well as um, other softer components as well. So particularly for rigid molded components, for example, uh, the finger or thumb inserts in gloves or the polystyrene kneecaps and pads. Some examples are semi-synthetic biopolymers such as PLA. And I think we have an example of this that Lillian would present later on. Uh, there are a range of different sugar-based plastics or starch-based thermoplastics, uh, and we are starting to explore in the next few projects some UK-based producers of these resources and materials as well. And there are a range of different seed oil-based plastics as well, if you think about cashew nut seed oil, soybean or rapeseed oil, um, for example. Uh, you could also combine many of these biopolymers with fibers if you want to improve the uh, mechanical performance. Um, and, and these fibers can come from waste, so end-of-life denim, carpet, or uh, clothes, um, as well as uh, reinforcements that are quite um, uh, low carbon already, for example, flax, jute, hemp, and date palm fiber, depending on where in the world you are located and what indigenous fibers you have readily available. Um, for high impact resistant rigid components, currently cane is used as well as paperboard, uh, providing cushioning and, and, and impact resistance. Um, and alternatives might be waste or short timbers, uh, as well as recycled cardboards or waste plastic materials like PVC piping. Um, and then the two other categories, 
uh, we have cushioning, foam, and filling. So instead of uh, wadding and high density polyurethane foams, which we find are actually some of the more uh, high impact um, in terms of environmental impact materials that are employed uh, and sh therefore should be the focus uh, of, of future work, include non isocyanate based polyurethanes given the uh, eco ecotoxicity and human toxicity of isocyanates as well as bio-based polyurethanes, and we discussed some of these examples before, uh, PLA-based foams as well, and waste fibers from agriculture. Uh, and for linings, so for example, for breathable polyester meshes and leathers, we explored some examples of alternative leathers before, and chamois leather has come out uh, really positively so far, and we are still waiting to hear uh, from uh, players who are using some of the gloves that were developed. Uh, and I think Lillian would present these in a bit more detail later on as well. Um, we also have recycled polyesters and semi-synthetic or natural fibers that could be adopted. Um, and I think in probably the penultimate or final slide, um, uh, we identify a range of different sustainable alternatives that are uh, viable or available However, their viability still still needs to be assessed in terms of what are the key performance criteria. Uh, we also should recognize that um, just because they are bio-based or renewable does not mean that they are circular and in still designing circularity through uh, enabling design for disassembly in the products themselves is quite critical uh, because biocomposites themselves may have their own end of life challenges. Um, we also should, and therefore we should focus on the ease of disassembly and recovery recycling, avoiding glues and thinking about stitching particularly. Um, and while we move towards 100% renewable materials, we should also think about recovered or recycled uh, cascading uses of materials as well. Uh, an open question is what impact indicators should we focus on as there are so many. Um, and also we need to be think about, we need to think about skills, uh, who will be making these products um, as well as supply chain implications. Great. Thank you, Darshil. Um, so yes. The, the next step um, within the project uh, was to conduct an online uh, survey with um, cricket players. And the main the aims of this uh, survey was first to identify a key product circuit, um, key product related failures, but also understand uh, levels of awareness um, and interest in sustainability issues amongst uh, players and uh, users. Next slide, please. Um, so an online survey was conducted um, in April 2023. Uh, the survey was circulated um, amongst a network of um, 114 individuals involved in cricket, uh, five cricket players who then distributed this further via um, their teams. And the survey was piloted with four uh, cricket experts to verify the scope and content of the questionnaire. Uh, the overall response rate was um, 42, so we received uh, 42 responses um, in total. Uh, next slide, please. And in terms of a survey, um, in terms of the survey demographic and context, context um, the majority of um, respondents uh, played at a league level, 83% uh, identified as male players. And uh, the majority um, of respondents were over the age of uh, 55. In total, um, the number of games played per year uh, was 13. And <clears throat> in terms of cricket gear uh, use phase, uh, cricket gloves appear to be kept for over eight seasons by 38% of the respondents and between two and three seasons uh, for Oh, and between two and three seasons um, by 36% um, uh, of the response. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in, uh, as for um, the, the findings from the, from the survey, in terms of sustainability considerations, um, 
57% of the respondents indicated that they had considered uh, the environmental impact of cricket gear in the past six months. However, when asked to elaborate further, um, specific um, environmental issues had not been uh, identified. Uh, for those that had considered uh, the environment, uh, the majority focused on uh, the disposal of the cricket gear at the end of life and the carbon footprint uh, associated with the um, cricket gear supply chain. Um, and within, uh, within this, uh, the carbon emissions related to the overseas uh, manufacturing and transportation were perceived as the highest contributor. And this was followed um, by the use of uh, materials derived from uh, non-renewable sources. Uh, respondents were also asked um, questions around their acceptability in terms of repair, reuse and refurbishment services to which 59, um, almost 60% uh, indicated that um, they were unaware of any organizations that offered um, th this service. Um, with the main um, organizations identified by those that had, that were aware um, was Lord Taverner's uh, kit, um, kit recycling scheme, um, followed by local club initiatives. Uh, next slide, please. Um, resp uh, respondents were also asked um, what were their main reasons for purchasing new gear. Uh, and uh, the main reasons were primarily um, related to wear and tear, so general use of um, their gear. Also um, seeking improvements in terms of performance or technology, design innovation, as well as uh, sponsorship uh, changes. Um, oh, could we go? Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, no, next slide. Sorry. Yes. Um, and then in terms of um, the product uh, failures that were identified, both for batting pads and gloves, uh, for batting pads, the main um, failure identified was related to the straps. So, for example, the straps tearing off, breaking, becoming loose, or the velcro of the straps um, beginning to fail. Uh, followed by um, issues related to the exterior material, so the PU leather. Um, so this material um, easily rips, slips, um, splits, um, and causes the internal padding to become exposed. Uh, lastly, um, there were... Um, a, a third failure identified for the batting pads um, was primarily related to uh, padding um, issues. So, for example, exposed padding or a mold due to um, sweat and storage conditions. As for um, the batting gloves, 41% uh, indicated that the main failure um, related, was related to the wear and tear of the palms, and this included uh, stiffening or cracking of the leather, um, that also affected uh, impact on the grip and um, holes that started to emerge uh, on the palms. Uh, this was followed by wear and tear of the straps. Um, so this, this is quite a common fault uh, between bat, bats, um, batting pads and uh, batting gloves. And the third um, main failure for the gloves um, was related to sweat and odor um, considerations. Uh, in the palm, which also um, um, affected the appearance and uh, the touch of uh, gloves. Next slide, please. Um, and then thirdly, uh, respondents were asked um, questions around um, how they cared for their cricket gear and also uh, market acceptability for repair services for cricket gear, but also um, uh, market acceptability around a transition towards uh, plant-based uh, vegan leathers. So um, when asked um, how cricket gear is cared for, uh, the majority of respondents um, said that they don't provide specific care um, for their gear after each game, uh, apart from wiping down um, the dirt or mud or just leaving it open air um, to dry until the next game. Uh, in terms of the disposal of um, cricket gear, 29% indicated um, that they donated uh, their gear to unwanted, um, their unwanted gear to charity and um, acceptance towards uh, a repair service for cricket gear um, was uh, respond as positive um, by 86% um, of the respondents. Um, now, the main reasons provided for the potential use of uh, cricket gear repair service um, was to reduce waste, 
Uh, this was followed by the potential cost savings. Um, so it would be cheaper. It had to be cheaper than buying uh, new gear and to reduce the environmental impact um, associated with the production of um, new gear. However, um, respondents also indicated that to enable uh, the repair of um, cricket gear, there needs to be a greater availability of repair services, uh, including um, access to infrastructure or um, places to take the gear for repair and the implementation of systems um, for specific collection points. Um, and then lastly, 71% of participants um, responded positively to the potential use of um, cricket gear made from plant-based uh, vegan leathers. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so in terms of um, conclusions and recommendations from the survey, um, while the use of bovine leather was not considered to be a high contributor to the negative environmental impact associated with the production of cricket gear, uh, respondents um, indicated willingness to shift to cricket gear made from um, a plant-based uh, vegan leather if this matched or increased existing durability, performance characteristics, and uh, was affordable. Uh, the survey also highlighted that uh, user player confidence in um, plant-based vegan leather materials is low um, it, with regards to its quality, durability, uh, and technical performance. So in order for users to adopt um, this alternative materials, uh, firstly, industry needs um, to address uh, consumer confidence in the material. Uh, the survey also highlighted the lack of um, aftercare practices. Um, which presents an opportunity for industry to invest um, to invest in providing users with uh, web-based instructions on how to look after their example lessons can be learned from other industries such as the fashion and clothing sector that is currently their sustainability work um, and also um, it's important to highlight that uh, the findings presented in in, um, in this survey are based on an older demographic um, and therefore further research focusing on a younger demographic and perhaps a female perspective is required to better understand uh, the requirements for the development of um, circular cricket gear. Uh, not, well, also, um, it's important to highlight that the survey um, also indicated that there are opportunities for repair and refurbishment um, services. As um, mentioned previously, the failures that have been identified uh, target very specific parts and components. And um, this suggests that the overall product uh, remains uh, uncompromised. Uncom Next slide, please. So taking into account um, the various research activities that have been presented uh, so far. Um, the next step was to implement um, circular design innovations within uh, within cricket gear. Now, for the focus now for the uh, focus of the um, circular design innovations that we will present, um, these are focused on uh, batting pads. Now, this is primarily due to um, time, budget, and also technical um, constraints. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so taking into account um, the various findings, uh, the brief, we, we developed a brief that focused on batting pads addressing the following areas. Uh, first of all, uh, the replacement of fossil fuel uh, derived materials with renewable world alternatives. Secondly, uh, tackling the high volume of waste as a result of cricket gear being landfilled. And thirdly, to address issues related to the damage um, to the straps and the wear and tear of the external material uh, of the batting pads. Um, next slide, please. Um, and in order to do so, uh, we created uh, five visuals uh, describing um, the the different uh, design innovations and each visual uh, described the materials required um, for, the, for the design innovation, but also um, the skills uh, required. So these were identified as, uh, for example, de-stitching, cutting, operating an industrial sewing machine uh, to a high standard. Uh, previous experience in leather um, would be uh, useful, uh, but not essential. 
And then <clears throat> each visual uh, contained uh, specifications related to the targeted uh, product part component, a list of, um, and the processes to complete uh, the prototype. Uh, these were presented in a PowerPoint to potential makers, um, which was then distributed across a series of um, network of uh, social enterprises amongst uh, UCA colleagues uh, within the business and fashion departments um, to identify the appropriate uh, maker. Now, it was uh, anticipated that finding um, the maker for this prototype um, would be quite straightforward. Um, however, early on, it became apparent that um, there is a lack of um, skills within the UK to make uh, cricket gear. Uh, so whilst um, the maker was not identified uh, through these uh, connections, um, it was only through an ad hoc uh, conversation with um, someone inquiring about uh, the project uh, that a relevant person um, was identified um, to um, proceed with uh, making the prototype. And um, this was a multi-skilled um, prop designer uh, working at a major um, theater. Next slide, please. Um, so in order to um, decide, uh, the aim was to produce the, the five uh, in design innovations. However, um, we created this matrix to assess amongst us um, in terms of their feasibility, whether it was um, relatively straightforward or uh, there would be uh, any technical challenges. And based on this ma matrix, uh, we decided to um, implement only four of the innovations. So we excluded um, a, a designing for disassembly that would uh, implement um, some clip-on straps to be able to replace uh, the straps um, from the batting pads. And therefore, uh, four uh, carried out. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so these were um, creating a batting pad with um, a plant-based uh, vegan leather using Pinatex light, reusing uh, internal components from an end of um, from an end of first life uh, batting pad, repairing a pair of um, cricket batting pad straps, and um, developing. Uh, 3D printed kneecaps using a sustainable material alternative. Next slide, please. So I, I will start with um, the process for creating the batting pad using uh, Pinatex light and the reused internal components. Uh, in total, this innovation took 12 hours. Um, so there's a breakdown of um, the various, um, the various uh, steps um, and we, we will go into these in further detail through the process. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yes, yeah, so a first step, um, as mentioned, was to uh, dissemble the end of life um, batting pad uh, to study the various components and also produce um, the patterns, uh, which can be seen uh, in the image uh, to the left, A. Uh, and yeah, th this took about um, three hours. Uh, the pattern was marked, um, at leaving one centimeter for a seam allowance. And then once the patterns were created, um, cutting the material uh, Pinatex light uh, was relatively straightforward and time efficient. Uh, the batting um, pad outer case uh, was then reconstructed in two um, parts. So starting with the bottom section, uh, proceeding to and then proceeding to assemble uh, the top section, uh, which includes the kneecap uh, protector. So, um, starting with the bottom section, uh, the plant-based uh, vegan leather and the lining uh, were stitched together using a bagging out technique. And uh, what's the stitching the bottom section of the pad? Uh, the straps were also included, which can be seen in image um, C and D. Uh, and a gap was left at the base to insert um, the padding. Um, the top section, sorry. Uh, next slide, please, sorry. Uh, and then the top section of the batting pad um, was turned inside out. And so the, um, 
it was the previous section, uh, the previous slide, please. Yeah, so moving on to uh, image C, uh, the top section of the batting pad um, was then turned inside out and um, the lines for the protective and structural canes of the padding were marked on the pattern, um, which you can um, faintly see on, on image C. Um, and they were stitched um, from bottom to top, uh, allowing space for uh, the canes and the padding to be inserted. And then this was st um, stitched at the top uh, to close the bind, to close and bind uh, the edge of the pad. Next slide, please. Uh, after completing uh, the bottom um, batting pad, uh, the maker proceeded to develop uh, the top section of the pad. Um, so again, using the bagging out technique um, uh, to stitch the the lining with the um, plant-based uh, vegan leather, and um, and then image um, I shows how the top section um, was then reconstructed with the bottom section. Uh, the maker also highlighted this step um, was quite tricky due to the thickness of the padding. Um, and recognize that um, this process can be uh, improved. Next section, please. Um, now in image um, J, we can see that uh, the smoothness um, was not achieved uh, compared to um, existing batting pads, um, but overall the integrity of the batting pads um, was achieved. Um, and then, um, to finalize the, the um, prototype, uh, existing um, back support of the pad um, was assembled, as well as the um, knee cap and the knee locator um, section that you can see in image L. And then um, the image it, um, shows the final, uh, the final prototype um, that was really um, that includes uh, Penitex light and uh, the reused internal padding. Uh, next slide. Um, and then the, uh, the next innovation was to repair um, the batting uh, pad straps. So um, this consisted in replacing uh, the Velcro straps um, to explore options for repairing for Greek batting pads and identify potential uh, design innovations required to enable repair. Uh, this process was um, relatively straightforward, uh, quite time efficient. It took 25 minutes in total, 10 minutes to unstitch the previous Velcro and 15 minutes um, to restitch uh, the new Velcro. The Velcro was um, purchased online and is widely available in uh, the exact dimensions required. Um, overall, uh, the result um, is a highly effective solution for um, extending the use phase of the product. And um, while the repair was undertaken by an experienced maker, um, feedback from maker suggests that this repair can be undertaken by a user or a player with um, zero to basic uh, sewing skills. Um, so as, as um, a recommendation um, to facilitate this, uh, Cricut gear manufacturers could potentially offer um, spare, vel spare Velcro um, along with online instructions on how to repair as a potential um, solution uh, to keep the products uh, in use for longer. Next slide, please. Um, lastly, uh, the fourth innovation um, was to identify um, alternative materials for replacing uh, this um, thermoformed um, polystyrene uh, kneecap. Um, and um, the most feasible, um, the most uh, feasible way to do this, um, sorry, <laughs> um, uh, was by um, 3D printing um, the piece using a PLA filament or and a fishy fishy filaments, um, which is a nylon uh, based filament using end of life um, fishing gear. Uh, so for this process, um, the uh, some CAD files had to be um, produced. 
this was done um, by scanning uh, the original piece. However, um, some challenges were encountered. Um, for example, uh, the piece um, does not contain uh, flat surfaces, um, so a structural support um, had to be constructed, which can see, which can be seen in these images. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so after these challenges were overcome, um, the final uh, prototypes uh, were developed. So you can see in the bottom images, uh, we produced um, some standard PLA kneecaps and uh, at the top, uh, the fishy filament um, kneecaps. Now the, these were tested in-house um, for their resistance um, and structural integrity um, just by compressing them, um, by um, compressing um, they seem to be uh, quite um, rigid in that sense, um, so uh, further testing would be required uh, to, ID to identify whether they meet um, standard, uh, British standards, uh, for example, for protective, um, for, for protective um, personal gear uh, for cricketers. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of um, conclusions from the prototype development, uh, the prototypes uh, are aligned to a TRL-3, um, so experimental proof of concept. Um, within the constraints of time, budget, materials, and skills availability, uh, the development of this circular batting pad um, is a useful starting point to develop further innovations, improvements in making and experimentation with new materials. Uh, as mentioned previously, technical and user player testing will enhance um, the practicality and the development and compliance with industry standards, such as um, the British Standards um, Protective Equipment for Cricketers. Uh, while there are visible um, aesthetic faults in uh, the circular batting pad prototype, uh, the structural integrity and protective elements of the product appear to have been achieved. Um, and the internal padding and other components uh, have been reused from existing end of life uh, batting pad, um, which proves uh, the concept. Um, however, user player and technical testing is required to confirm that uh, the protective properties of such batting pad um, have not been compromised. Next slide, please. Uh, and then, uh, recommendations from um, from producing the, the prototype um, parts and components uh, that remain in good condition, uh, such as the internal uh, high density foam and the knee caps, present an opportunity for reuse. Um, further research is required to test the plant based vegan leather batting pads under standard game conditions to assess the durability, abrasion capacity, and breathability. Um, Producing batting pads with second life components can be replicated. Uh, however, this uh, process requires further iterations um, to improve, for example, the time and effort uh, related to inserting, uh, reinserting the internal padding um, and the time and effort um, to harvest uh, used parts and components. Um, further exploration of other parts and components that can be repaired and reuse is recommended. Um, and um, in terms of the 3D uh, printed kneecaps, uh, technical testing is required to confirm that they um, possess the structural integrity. Um, and then the commercial viability um, for the innovations presented uh, requires a detailed cost analysis, analysis which um, the Centre for Sustainable Design intends to uh, produce in further uh, related uh, projects. Thank you. Next slide, please. And with this, I will pass on to uh, Martin for the final section. Thank you, Martin. Unmute myself. So thanks, Lilith and Dasha. I'll uh, try and move through the uh, key uh, policy and stakeholder implications from the research. And then hopefully we'll have about 15 minutes or so for uh, for, uh, for any questions or observations or thoughts. So 
So there are multiple uh, stakeholders involved in the direct or indirect direct specification and use of cricket gear. Uh, governing bodies, even financial backers, your broadcasters, whatever, is in a sense to play the game, you need the gear and you need the players and you need the grounds. So gear is essential uh, part of the game. Uh, yet there is very little research that has been done in, into the sustainability and circularity issues as, as uh, they apply to that gear. There are organisations uh, within government, uh, both central government and local government, who have an interest. Um, you've then got those who are directly engaged and have influence over issues related to design and development, the MCC in terms of laws of the game related to certain product categories. You've got the kit uh, brands and manufacturers and suppliers. Uh, you've got standards bodies, uh, players themselves, you know, and in various contexts from clubs to schools, uh, etc. So there's a lot of stakeholders there uh, in who have uh, um, an, an interest. Um, so in terms of design and development, I'm not going to repeat the the case key stakeholders. These uh, are above in in each of the slides and also we have a backup series of reports for everything that we've presented today so you know sustainability does need to be considered more in relation to cricket gear because there's a lot of it and there's a lot of potential waste and um, materials and components and products that are that are not having their life extended so they're not it's not you're being fully the materials is you know, et cetera, and products are not being fully utilised. There's growing global interest, um, but particularly by younger people. I mean, this is another presentation, but I believe we're in a fifth green consumer wave at the moment. Uh, so there is growing interest. And the fourth wave was driven by, by youth. Uh, so there is growing interest there. Um, you know, we do have some evidence by our, our initial survey uh, that we will extend in a new project of uh, awareness uh, by players of sustainability issues um, and interest in repair services and potential use of new bio-based bio materials if they perform at least as well as the existing material. Um, you know, there are, uh, you know, a need to do more research into uh, you know, the links between circularity and the embodied carbon associ associated with the design and, and development of cricket gear and the fact that significant proportion of cricket gear is imported. Um, so one of the things we're looking to explore is could we bring back cricket gear manufacturing production to the UK? Could we use locally based materials could we regenerate some of the skills? Um, there are a number of simple design changes that can be undertaken to bring more circularity in cricket gear development. And we've heard a lot of these. And just for example, uh, in the gloves, you'll still have at the end of the first life of cricket gloves, the um, thumb protectors are unlikely to have lost their structural uh, integrity and so have a potential reuse opportunity and and also the kneecaps for example are unlikely to lose their integrity so those are two very clear issues where even if damaged pads are um, come to the end of the first life then maybe one could be extracting those um uh, those components and and storing and reincorporating those into into products there is clearly an opportunity for a manufacturer to step up and take leadership in this issue there has been some limited um, innovations in this space that have even uh, seemed to have been very popular but for a variety of reasons that are still not entirely clear to us some of these have not been taken forward so um I think that last point there really um, is is reinforcing what I've uh, previously mentioned. So in terms of reuse, um, 
we've seen that there are growing issues, uh, particularly with the energy crunch at the moment, with people having less uh, money in their pocket, uh, that uh, the cost of gear um, seems to be becoming a growing issue. Uh, if if you have, say, two young children who are playing cricket, you can see there's some tough decisions that may be having to be made by people where one, uh, you know, one uh, youngster may be able to play with full gear and the other may not. So um, cost of living and the cost of cricket gear, uh, because it's such a gear intensive sport, is, is coming up. Uh, on the agenda um, in the media and and amongst players there are there are there are a a few a handful of cricket gear reuse schemes in place the most notable uh, by Lords Taverners who run a, an excellent very uh, well organized initiative with relatively with very few people uh, but 90, approximately 95% of the cricket gear that comes into them is then distributed overseas. You know, um, there's got to be opportunity to reutilize um, some of that cricket gear in disadvantaged communities, um, you know, in the UK, particularly bearing in mind cost of living the uh, and the uh, IC, I still can't say it properly, ICES, uh, report that highlighted the inequalities in, in cricket. Um, we do see, you know, quite significant amount of cricket gear just sitting in in lofts, in attics, uh, in garages, and in clubs. You know, bearing in mind these challenges that we're part, you know, highlighting, you know, the the, the meaning that people that want to participate and play can't because they can't afford or cannot gain access to gear. It, 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 it is, um, you know, crazy that we don't have the systems to release this stored waste to enable people to play the game. This also is true in the challenges between uh, the private school system and the state school system, where, which again was highlighted in the report that, um, you know, the cost of year is a big challenge uh, to enable uh, state schools to play, and surely we've got—it's not beyond the the realms of, uh, they say, the cricket community and and the wider stakeholders to facilitate more reuse of gear in into the schools. So setting up a a, 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 a more comprehensive structure to do this uh, would seem to be a, a priority. Um, we've seen um, and found a very limited repair and reuse schemes in place, uh, particularly uh, uh, for gloves and pads, etc. Over the last couple of decades, a number of manufacturers and specialists do offer back repair. But when you come to pads and gloves, we found virtually no services a handful of services repairing wicketkeeper gloves, but nothing else. And if, you know, what the survey highlighted was, you know, this interest in repair services. So that is something that we're going to explore in, in more detail. Um, we also identified that um, there was or there is interest, even in an older demographic, which was uh, interesting in the potential use of uh, uh, alternative leathers uh, for cricket gear, but not under, not surprisingly, they had to perform as well uh, as as conventional bovine leather, and they needed to be cost effective. There was, you know, a, a perceptual issue associated with that, but you know, generally there was a positive. Um, uh, you know, people seemed to welcome the idea if it if it ticked all the boxes say which is uh it was it is interesting particularly bearing in mind that older demographic and again what we found in actually physically um uh producing the the final prototype um of the batting pad um 
uh, alongside the, uh, the 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 vegan leather uh, gloves that that Darshaw mentioned that we haven't got time to go into today. Today, that really we were we we thought we'd be able to access the skills um, to to produce this prototype relatively uh, easily through our different networks, um, but we found it extremely difficult, and it was really a random conversation that led to finding somebody, um, a multi-skilled prop designer, as Lillian mentioned, in a theatre, who would have connected theatre to cricket, other than a, a few plays that have uh, existed in the past. But in the other sense, it wasn't surprising because those prop designers have to be multi-skilled um, because they're dealing with you know all sorts of different productions with all sorts of different clothing and all sorts of different sets. So, set, set. so it's finding people who have that multi-skilled um, skill set. It is still incredibly labor intensive to produce this. And I think we identify we could reduce the time, but from a commercial perspective to start to bring in some of these new uh, innovations, um, you do have the comparative problem of the labor costs in Northern Indian Pakistan versus the UK. So, what we're also ex hope to be exploring in a, in a new project is the potential to work with social enterprises um, to, to maybe uh, train uh, disadvantaged groups to, to, to make new cricket gear and to provide repair and refurbishment services. Just in closing, um, you know, uh, we feel that um, you know, it's great that some, um, you know, uh, governing bodies and counties are focusing about reducing energy in uh, buildings and facilities. And that's great and important. But hopefully from our research and our experience, we can now see actually dealing with some of these circularity issues is an important issue that decision makers should be addressing because it aligns with a number of high level issues that have been um, increasingly emerging in the game. The British standards are outdated and need to be reviewed. Uh, one of the cricket standards, I can't remember precisely which one, has not been updated since 1980. Um, I won't say any more. I think Darshall's work on the his own individual work and his team's work on bamboo cricket bats has uh, indicated the challenges with the existing laws of the game, potentially um, uh, potentially stifling innovation. Um, and I think another issue that came out of this uh, study and our other studies was uh, this real lack of understanding about the supply side of, of cricket. We reckon, and there's no concrete data on this, but there's around about 250 organisations supplying cricket gear uh, in some shape or form in the UK market. But it's not organised, it's a series of subgroups and, uh, you know, an organised group on the supply side could actually more effectively tackle, you know, uh, policy changes, look at innovation and sharing knowledge. So I'd just like to pick, to pick up this final point. I literally picked this up 10 minutes before our presentation. And in the swiftness that we've tried to operate in this project, I thought I'd include it. This is Moen Ali, the iconic uh, Asian cricketer, um, who has just been quoted on the BBC website as saying the equipment is 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 expensive. Cricket is an expensive sport. We need to make a, a lot it a lot easier to access uh, for people from underprivileged backgrounds who cannot afford to buy a bat, pads, gloves. Something needs to be done. So this literally uh, emerged, as I say, just this afternoon on Twitter. And there are others uh, such as Matt Pryor, the ex-England player, who's come up with similar statements and others. So we're seeing highly visible players now uh, starting to make these statements. And I think the key stakeholders in the game really need to step up and join the dots up to see how we can move forward. 
So um, we'll, we will share the video link and the links to all the reports. And we uh, will, we are in the process of uh, starting to uh, move into a new project that we'll be exploring uh, the potential use of, of biomaterials along the lines of uh, um, what Darshan and Lena highlighted. And then we, we hope to be moving forward on a, a new project where we can explore some of these issues in terms of um, social, potential development of, of social, uh, social enterprises. So I'd like to thank you all very much.